Kalfried Graf Durkheim opens the introduction to his masterwork, Hara the Vital Center, with these prophetic words. Western ways of life have come to the end of their fruitfulness. Rationalism has made its final contribution, and modern people will succumb increasingly to physical and spiritual decay unless they find some new way of coming back to their essential self and to the true purpose of life. Durkheim was a psychotherapist and spiritual teacher who revealed to us the bridge between our ordinary awareness and the inexpressibly vaster consciousness of our true self. He died on December 28, 1988, at the age of 92, and has left in the wake of his lifetime thousands of persons who have been radically transformed by encountering the man in his teaching. He was born in Munich in 1896, heir to Bavarian nobility. In childhood he already showed an unusual receptivity to the presence of transcendent reality. In the book Dialogue on the Path of Initiation, recently published by Globe Press Books, he shares many of his personal experiences. This is the first true introduction to his life. He tells us of the four years on the front during the First World War, which brought him face to face with death and the feeling of a vaster life available to humankind. These are his words. I was barely 18 years old when I went into the army. There I was harshly confronted with death, which profoundly anchored the experience of transcendence in my life. I remember it was on the front. The first dead man I saw was a Frenchman in red trousers on the side of the road. In the wide open and fixed eyes of the corpse, I encountered a sort of dreadful sneering which both attracted me and urged me to run away, held me back and chased me along the road until finally, free and relieved, I had the sensation of rediscovering life as never before. Suddenly, Life was no longer something obvious, but a supernatural fullness on the terrifying backdrop of non-life. Each time I left an area threatened by death, there rose in me a mighty gratefulness for being alive and feeling myself alive. It is in this atmosphere that life as such took on a luminous character for me. I discovered at the same time that it was in facing death that we step forward toward true life. That experience was later part of my teaching. By accepting death, we discover and receive life which is beyond life and death. A short time later, he came across the writings of the 14th century mystic Meister Eckhart. There he found the same thing the necessity of letting go of our conceptual consciousness and habitual feeling of self in order to be penetrated by a transcendent reality which is nothing less than the birth of God in our being. He studied psychology and philosophy, becoming a professor in Kiel for a time. In the mid-1930s, he left for Japan where he spent eight years at the feet of Zen masters. Durkheim realized that the deeper dimension of human consciousness has been left out of Western psychology, philosophy, and religion. His exposure to Eastern wisdom introduced him to methods of opening himself to these transforming depths. Kalfried Graf Durkheim respected each individual's personal spiritual path and revealed new insights to his students, regardless of the tradition they followed. He taught them to listen to the secret core of their being, and initiated them into the discovery of each person's inner master. In 1948, Durkheim established the Center of Existential and Psychological Formation and Encounter in the village of Totmos Hute in the Black Forest. Since then, thousands of persons from around the world have come to him to undergo his initiatory therapy. 
As with all teachings, Durkheim uses certain terms for his foundational ideas. His recurring reference to the existential self stands for the artificial identity made of unconscious habits, fears, and imitation. The essential self refers to that vaster self which is part of transcendent being as the drop is part of the ocean. Durkheim teaches that through making sustained efforts we can become not only receptive but transparent to the greater life within us which links us to the universe. Another key phrase is the path of initiation upon which all must enter who would experience and evolve into a higher level of conscious awareness. Before entering upon the path, however, there is the flash of an awakening experience. The inner struggle begins with those fleeting but unforgettable moments which have flooded us with inexpressible feelings of joy, peace or gratitude. This sometimes subtle but always overwhelming event often takes place in times of crisis, where the sight of great beauty, and in the wonder light of childlike freedom and openness. Such experiences are at the heart of every religion. They are encounters with that which Jung called the numinous. These intimations of the divine, awareness of the presence of God, or glimpses of vaster consciousness call each one of us to a process of transformation which opens onto the eternal dimension of existence. The aim is to experience a breakthrough of being which lifts us out of our ordinary mundane states of consciousness. The exercises for entering this path of initiation to one's own self-becoming are for the most part taken from the treasury of Eastern wisdom. Meditation, intentional breathing, presence to the moment, detachment, bodily harmony. Above all, the exercises are aimed at turning everyday activities into channels of metamorphosis. Durkheim was fond of the ancient Asian wisdom which holds that every moment is the best of opportunities for awakening within. He tells us, daily life as exercise means that our way of being present can be an attitude which sustains the golden thread to our depths. It can be a matter of washing a dish or doing housework. You can water a flower without your spirit being completely involved in it, simply because the flower needs water. But you can also make of it a gesture of love. And that is something entirely different. You can enter into it in such a way that it develops the inner life. That is work on oneself. True to his pragmatic approach to conscious evolution, Durkheim stresses the difference between having an experience of enlightenment and becoming an enlightened person. The latter requires an intentional, demanding relationship to the moment where focused attention is the least of our obligations. The path of initiation which Durkheim helps us to travel begins with a disposition which becomes more and more open to what he calls the influx of cosmic forces. Progress on the path means entering a transforming process which melts us down and ultimately makes it possible to express this experience of being through the radiance of our way of living. He tells us, there is a difference between the pure mystic and the person on the path of initiation. The life of the mystic is a constant seizing by the divine through transcendental experiences, while the person on the path of initiation works in an organized fashion toward the right attitude of the whole individual. There is an inner work to be done, one that is invisible and constant, regardless of the external circumstances. Such a sustained effort of attention and concentrated presence requires knowledge and practice. From his experiences in the East, Durkheim developed his initiatory therapy, which he describes in this way. 
beginning with an experience of being, the path progresses step by step toward the heart of an initiation, in a sequence of stages through which we move out of the superficial existence of our ordinary consciousness and break through to the depths of a consciousness where transcendent being resides. At the threshold of the path is a radical shift of orientation, a conversion. From then on, it is divine being which gradually penetrates within and transforms us. Durkheim knows that the transcendent is imminent within us as it is within all things. The deeper life which all religious, esoteric and psychological paths point toward is hidden only by a thin veil of sleep and illusion. Durkheim tells us that these numinous experiences which we have all encountered at passing moments and which he names life's starry hours can lead to a state of transparency or receptivity which allows a greater life to manifest itself in us and through us. Self-realization means becoming a witness to transcendent being. But in order to accomplish this, something more is needed than profound experience over which we have no control. This is where the struggle, indeed the warfare of initiation comes into play. The essence of Durkheim's wisdom is therefore centered around the experience of transformation. Everything he taught is directly linked to the practical, holistic awakening of the deeper dimensions of our identity, whose roots commingle with the infinite. It all begins with a shift in our consciousness, whereby we become aware of that which is not visible and in which everything is rooted. Here we move from Eastern practices and depth psychology to the spiritual dimension, which became the ultimate aim of all Durkheim's life and work. He tells us, every time the existential self dies a little and gives way, we enter more deeply into contact with our essence and the life from which can be born a self that is not of this world. There is no transformation without unbecoming. Durkheim speaks to us of a being beyond space and time, seeking to introduce one to the experience of this dimension of reality. He explains, to the traditional forms of therapy is added today a new one, a therapy of initiation. This is something entirely different it deals with salvation. But the therapist is not the one who heals, that is, who intervenes with his own skills. He is a therapist in the original meaning of the word, a companion on the way. The word salvation takes here its deeper meaning, its fundamentally religious meaning. The aim is to pull us out of our despair and lead us to wholeness. This despair is our constitutive condition we are in despair because we are prisoners of our I, our ego, delivered over to the world, separated from our essential being, closed into our spatial temporal condition, depending on our rational spirit and separated from reality, which transcends reason and whose nature is beyond time and space. Durkheim then turns to his own experience and tells us, I had experienced that which is spoken of in all centuries. Individuals in whatever stage of their lives have had an experience which struck them with the force of lightning and linked them once and for all to the true circuits of life. They become conscious that it is not only a source of great joy, but also of suffering when this circuit is broken. At the same time, this experience reveals the unconditional mission which leads to the inner way. This mission has two sides. First, one must step onto this inner path. Second, 
one is given the responsibility to help other persons who also seek this path. The stages of an inner path are not cut off from the world, as though we had to relinquish our obligations of daily life to lead the life of a hermit or of an ascetic. This is not the case, even when Durkheim uses a vocabulary that deals with initiation and mystery. It all must ultimately be manifested in our behavior and action in the world. Durkheim pointed out that the way inward rests on three factors. The first is an experience wherein the light of being illuminates the darkness of life. The second is insight into the relationship between our worldly ego and our transcendental being. The third is practice, which corrects the wrong working of the misguided ego and builds up a right attitude toward every moment of our lives. One thing must occur for this change to take place. Training, whether in meditation or in exercises which integrate the body in this process of metamorphosis. This change which begins within does not in any way exclude the body. But before discussing this method, we must return to Durkheim's own search for the path and his discovery of exercises which formed his inner practice. Durkheim's own inner practice was strongly influenced by Zen Buddhism. He wrote, My familiarity with Meister Eckhart facilitated my approach to Zen. What does Zen teach? Every being in his original nature is a Buddha. His original face is disfigured by the mundane self. The condition of maturation whose fruit is a person liberated by his Buddha nature is therefore the death of the self in the experience of being. Now even if Durkheim speaks in this context of the Buddha and the acquisition of the Buddha nature, we must understand that what this ultimately means for him is not an introduction into Buddhist or Eastern spirituality. Rather, he wanted to make accessible a specific experience generated by meditation exercises. He tells us, exercise has a double purpose to prepare the individual for the possibility of an experience of being and for his metamorphosis into a witness of this experience. His master taught him that in Zen it is the same as for all serious spiritual effort. A particular exercise cannot be reduced to a sequence of activities, whether it be archery or meditation. Little by little, all the activities of life must be brought under the ordering power of the exercise. Daily life becomes the field of exercise. The issue is not what we do, but how we do it in relation to our right form, which is to be transparent to transcendent being. The years in Japan represent a special formation for Durkheim's later work as teacher of meditation and guide on the inner path. Yet his encounter with Zen and his study of Eastern spirituality have created misunderstandings, as did his invitation to Buddhist monks and Japanese Zen masters to come to his center for initiatory therapy at Todmos Rute. He gave the impression, as professor, therapist, and writer, of being one of the many persons who, after the Second World War, transplanted to the West an Asian spirituality and way of life. In his works, Durkheim has always denounced these misunderstandings. What I am doing is not the transmission of Zen Buddhism. On the contrary, that which I seek after is something universally human which comes from our origins and happens to be more emphasized in Eastern practices than in the Western. What interests us is not something uniquely Oriental, but something universally human which the Orient has cultivated over the centuries and has never fully lost sight of. An example of the universal insight made possible from the East can be found in Durkheim's encounter with the great Buddhist scholar D.T. Suzuki. Master Suzuki said one day to Durkheim, Western knowledge looks toward the outside, 
Eastern wisdom look towards the inside. But if we look within in the way that we look without, we make of the inside an outside. In other words, we objectify, we fix things in a static state and that which is alive goes away. Durkheim extended Suzuki's insights and added that it is absolutely vital to know how to look outside the way we should look inside, making of the outside an inside. This would profoundly change our relationship to the world, to things and to ourselves. Our references would then be based on the most direct experience. In an effort to express Durkheim's teachings more specifically, I will now focus on the six fundamental aspects of his thought. The transcendent experience, essential being, initiatory therapy, hara, meditation, and finally Durkheim's spirituality. The question which preoccupied Durkheim is ultimately the following. How can the experience of transcendent being transform individuals in such a way that our earthly form manifests the radiance of divine being? The great experience which manifests the quality of being is characterized by the evidence of the taste, by the quality of radiance, and by its power of transformation. Here then is Mr. Durkheim's definitive expression of transcendent being, which is both our origin and the goal of our path of initiation. In the beginning and in the end, in the origin and in the unfolding of all life stands the transcendental I Am. Behind, within and above all that exists, man senses the great I Am of all life as the stillness of divine being, from which all life proceeds and to which it returns. The great I Am is the all-embracing divine spirit whose creative power lends forms to all beings and all things and gives to man his consciousness. Every being is destined to live the I Am of the divine in his own way. We must live in the world of space and time, but in it we are intended to manifest the transcendental. In our being our nature is transcendental, and yet we can only fulfill it if we live in the natural world. Durkheim observed, from our earliest experience of consciousness in childhood, and at every stage of our development, we are always animated at our deepest level by the need to rediscover the primal unity. This suggests that life on earth can be rightly achieved only if we do not fall out of the cosmic order and if we maintain our contact with the great original unity. This is not a matter of adding something to one's daily life. It is a quality which permeates all behavior and activity. Durkheim teaches that an action is conformed to the fundamental law of the transcendental when the interiority which underlies it and fills us is this transcendence. Transcendence can therefore imply two different things. On the one hand, a supernatural reality. On the other, an interior attitude through which all that one does or perceives takes on a transcendent meaning. For example, when two people meet, their handshake can be merely decorum, but that extended hand can also be the occasion of a transcendental encounter. For many people, meeting others does not go beyond the limits of the everyday hello, and yet there are those who feel and live every encounter in the context of the presence of God. For them, the whole of reality is contained within the divine, and the most ordinary action and the way in which it is carried out can witness to its presence. Whatever they do 
is intimately connected to that fundamental attitude which is always open to the manifestations of the imminent transcendental. To become conscious of this reality, we must adopt a specific disposition, a disposition of openness toward the inner depths of our being, so that greater being which wishes to manifest itself in us and through us in the world can reveal itself. If this disposition exists, the presence of the Divine can be felt in every attitude and every activity. We must therefore remove all that opposes this disposition and emphasize all that makes it possible. For example, the propensity to order everything into objective intellectual concepts prevents the experience of the transcendental. In fact, as soon as something of this experience is felt, it is immediately registered, fixed, classified, and reduced to known forms of experience by our rational consciousness. When this happens, the transcendental which desired to reach us is obstructed. To experience the transcendental, we must therefore first liberate ourselves from concepts which fill our mind. But to create emptiness is incredibly difficult because as soon as an image has disappeared, another one emerges. The Zen monk who seeks through meditation to enter the great void speaks of these images and thoughts which obsess us as the wild hordes of monkeys. There are other hindrances to the manifestation of the transcendent in our consciousness, such as wrong forms of self which cause us to live in tension or in dissolution. A consciousness of the transcendent within requires a manner of being present, attentive and passive to its presence, respecting it and being in harmony with it. The opportunity is then given to us to enter into or stay in contact with something which seeks us relentlessly. Yet even this attitude which consists of seeking something inhibits contact with that which we seek. For we seek for that which has in all ages sought us in the depths of ourselves in order to fulfill us. And it is precisely our seeking which can stop us from finding what is looking for us. This is a mighty paradox, often referred to in the writings of the great mystics. When we strain after something, we often cut ourselves off from the attitude of receptivity which allows the entry of what it is that we are seeking. Here is how Durkheim describes a person who is no longer victimized by this external self. The person at home in himself, that is the rightly centered individual, lives in that undisturbed state where the eternal out and in of breathing goes on peacefully in which they give themselves to the world without losing themselves in it, abiding there a while without being swallowed up by it, withdrawing themselves without thereby cutting themselves off from it, and remaining alone without ever hardening themselves. Aligned with the essence of all religious teachings, Durkheim points out that the successful ego is one not a rigid point, but the capacity for movement around a firm axis. Two, a capacity for change without the loss of individual form. Three, a penetrability which yet permits no breakdown of its boundaries. Durkheim tells us, our way inward is the way of uniting ourselves with our being whereby we partake of life beyond space and time. This is the way to maturity, the way that yields fruit in proportion to our success in integrating ourselves with our essential self. In his teaching, Durkheim always insisted on the necessity in psychological work of going beyond objectifying consciousness or arrow consciousness, which makes of the inner world an object of study. We must, on the contrary, enter into a cup consciousness, 
made of openness and acceptance toward our reality here and now, so that it relies on this reality for the work of transmutation of the ego, and makes of each situation, whether happy or miserable, agreeable or disagreeable, the best occasion to enter into the great experience. Obviously, we cannot avoid receiving such an experience through images and formulating it in words, objectifying it in some way. This is vital if we hope to communicate the experience. All religions have sought to formulate in a coherent way their first experience. What is often forgotten afterward is that this formulation does not deliver its contents through a simple lecture or through rational comprehension, but only to the one who in turn makes it his or her experience. Otherwise, we are reduced to external approaches, to instruments of analysis or interpretation, and that which was at its origin an invitation to live something extraordinary, to follow a path of discovery, becomes a paper chase for diplomas, theoretical arguments, or a pretext to puff up our little self. This is hardly a caricature of what has happened to Christianity. Without our being reborn on another level of consciousness beyond the rational self, we do not enter into living contact with this reality whose quality and significance are radically new, that is to say of which we can have no idea based on our own ideas. That is why conversion, the great turning around leading to the death of the ego, is the key to every biblical message as well as to all other religions we are invited into an amazing experience. The Gospel of John tells us, Come and see. It is the turning point of life which finally gives us ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to understand. We have said that each of us has some memory of this kind of sensation, even if it is not spectacular and even if we have not attributed much importance to it. Durkheim wrote in his Practice of the Inner Way, We suddenly feel ourselves in a strange ambience. We are entirely present, completely there, and yet not focused on anything in particular. We feel ourselves in a very peculiar way, without harshness, harmonious within ourselves, and very open. Because of this openness, a profound fullness emerges. We are both absent and present, overflowing with life. We rest within ourselves and we discover an inner affinity with everything that surrounds us. We are united to everything, yet detached from everything. We feel ourselves incredibly guided and yet free from all obligation poor in this world, but covered with riches and inner power. This is a sensation of participating in being. It has often been felt in the depths of despair, the terrifying anguish of death or annihilation. There again the experiences are many. Situations where death is close, wars, serious illness, accidents, fear is at its height, Death is inevitable, the last defenses of the little self are about to crumble. If at that precise moment we consent to lose our acquired positions and accept the unacceptable, we are suddenly invaded by a prodigious peace, freed from all fear and absolutely unassailable by death, however near it may be. For this living thing has taken hold of us, an indescribable power and fullness. We find ourselves in an entirely different dimension. The same experience is even better known among those who find themselves at the extreme limits of an absurd situation, plunged into the meaninglessness of life, where no remedy is possible. Situations of terrible injustices, inhuman treatment, senseless conditions of life times when resignation and rebellion would be dead ends. Being able to accept the unacceptable, that is, consenting to leave behind ordinary consciousness, 
is to be suddenly transfigured by a light which transcends absurdity or meaninglessness. It is a deeper meaning, beyond all meaning and meaninglessness, an inconceivable inner order. Other distresses which can provoke this experience of being occur when we are thrown into complete solitude, the loss of someone very close to us, or being excluded from a community, or total isolation. To let this reality penetrate you and say yes to the impossible pain, if only for a few seconds, can introduce us to a love beyond all limits of time and space. We then feel ourselves vitalized from within, surrounded at the heart of solitude, deeply connected to others, closer to them than ever before. Transformation is the best argument in witnessing to the truth of the experience of this other dimension of humanity. We cannot accuse someone of sentimental subjectivity or of illusion when he or she has been completely changed through the experience of being and now lives a radically new life. Kalfried Graf Durkheim tells us, This contact with being begins with an almost unconscious yearning of the heart and must be followed ceaselessly until we reach the fundamental experience of the explosion of the self and the realization of being which transforms everything. We will now examine that within us which can come into contact with transcendent being. Durkheim calls it the essential self. But first, we must be clear about the obstacle to this experience. It is that which we generally mistake as our true identity, the existential self. Here is its fundamental characteristic. The more this affirmation of the self increases in power, and that is its tendency in each moment, the more it falls into division, dualism, rupture. I separate myself from others. The person who is cut off from his or her roots in the divine, from the beyond within, lives only in the reduced horizontal dimensions of time and space with the reduced consciousness of the little self. Meister Eckhart has left us a picture which defies all logic of the inexpressible happiness which would rise in persons who recover their true identity. God takes such pleasure in this similitude or identity that he pours out his nature and his whole being. His pleasure is as great as a horse let loose in a flat plain who gallops as fast as he can because that is his nature and pleasure. So it is with God. It is his pleasure and rapture to discover someone's true identity because he can place his whole nature in it, being himself this identity. Unfortunately, we have identified ourselves with our rational self and let the most important part of ourselves fall into the night of the subconscious. Except for certain privileged hours of our life, it is very rare that we correspond with who we are in our depths, present to ourselves and our surrounding, that we reach our true capacities, that we become authentic. We always remain outside of our own reality. Most of the time, the experience we have of ourselves does not include who we really are. The reduction of humanity to its rational and objectifying self, exclusively functional and utilitarian, has created a great schism within us. The unity of being is broken and the consciousness of belonging to an undivided all, the openness toward the beyond within us, where we are originated and receive ourselves, is lost. Divided within and consequently separated from the rest of the universe, of which we were in a way the summary, cut off from the source of life, we have turned toward our little self living on the surface of things. So how do we become conscious of our essential being? It seems that we can only do so by proceeding in a negative fashion, forever asking ourselves the question, is my present attitude? Is my way of living this situation, is my way of addressing or responding to this person consistent 
with that which being requires of me. Essential being appears to us as eminently fragile and is usually made esoteric, repressed, covered up, submerged, reduced to powerlessness by the products, agitations and uprises of our mental life. Because our inner cinema takes up all the room and makes too much noise, we are dissociated, cut off from our deepest and most transcendent roots. We are beings who do not fully live, who limp along and cannot go very far, birds with only one wing turning in circles, ships not able to deploy all their sails. The masters of wisdom of all times and places have left us with the message that to live on a deeper level requires some form of discipline, some focus of attention, along with the making of unwavering choices. Here is where Kalfried Graf Durkheim has left us a most precious legacy, which in this part of the world is still in the state of buried treasure, waiting to give life to those who come across it. This treasure, which is nothing less than the synthesis and application of Durkheim's search and discoveries, is known as initiatory therapy. It is first of all a therapy that is a method of healing persons who are sick in their souls. Secondly, this therapy is initiatory because it deals with an entry into our own mystery. This is not merely a theoretical teaching but a process of maturing through which our self turned toward the external world becomes transparent to our true being. We become ourselves and reach maturity to the extent that our life rises from the depths of our being. This is no metaphysical speculation. It requires work with our body. Durkheim differentiates between two attitudes toward the body the body that we are and the body that we have. In the first case, the body that we are is the incarnation of our being, our way of being consciously present in the world and manifesting through material form. This is an integrated, holistic sense of oneself. The other way of relating to our body sees it as a lower thing, a slave, sometimes an enemy. This reflects the dualism and nearly psychotic dichotomy which we've inherited from Greek thought carried down the centuries on the wings of a superficial Christianity uprooted from its own Hebraic soil which did not have any such division. But, said Durkheim, in looking at you, I do not see a body behind which I imagine a soul. It is you that I see. In other words, I am my body. My body is my way of being here. It is my expression in the world. In it I experience my personhood and through my personhood I live and take shape. Consciousness of self is always physical. It means therefore that we are one, that the body is the place of initiation into the mysteries of life and that it is called to become transparent to being which rests in its depths so that it may bear witness to it in the world. The body can be the entryway onto the path of initiation at every moment, even in the least of its gestures. Here we come upon one of Durkheim's best-known insights, taken directly from his experience with Japanese Zen masters centering ourselves in our hara, in our vital powers. The Japanese term hara means nothing more than the physical embodiment of the original life center in man. Literally it means stomach, but that of course only refers to the general location of these forces. Hara is the very embodiment of our contact with the fundamental powers of the greater life manifested in us. It is a gift from life which is ours without our having earned it. But only by preserving the right center of gravity can it unfold its fullest meaning. This leads us to the central exercise on the path of initiation, meditation. Durkheim uses the word in its literal sense, itari in medio, being led toward the center. This center is essential being, our transcendent core. The practice of meditation is therefore a permanent exercise an intentional attitude in daily life, 
where each occasion reveals itself as the best one to advance on the way. Meditation is the only place where is fashioned the tool of continual vigilance, that which Durkheim called the state of critical watchfulness. Yet to enter upon an inner path as Durkheim did does not mean a retreat into an encapsulated self. He left us with these words. In everything one thinks or does, it is possible to foster and maintain a state of being which reflects our true destiny. When this possibility is actualized, the ordinary day is no longer ordinary. It can even become an adventure of the spirit.